John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was. But the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when man, men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou kept, hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. You may be seated. This is the first, I always like to say it this way. I like when I read it this way. This is the first recorded miracle. It's the first miracle that Jesus did that we are aware of. I don't know, had he ever fished and wasn't getting anything and nodded for the fish to come over? Maybe. Uh, had he done other things? I don't know, but we know that this is the first one recorded. So of all the miracles that we know about Jesus, that we preach about, we read and we study about, this is the first one, and it is unique. And every time I preach on this scripture, I point this out. I heard Debbie make this point many, many years ago, that this miracle is unique in that it really, it's just really not that important. It just really didn't do a lot to help anybody. And we don't think of it because this is, for some reason, this is still one of his most famous miracles that he did. Everybody knows the story of turning water into wine. Nobody was dying and no one was dead. And no one was sick. No one was, uh, had a blood issue. No one was lame, mute, blind. No one had leprosy. None of these life-altering things was happening. But every point of the message this morning and every point of this scripture cries that Jesus cares. Jesus cares. As no one was starving, he didn't feed anyone. And if they had not had enough wine, they would have been just fine. They would have lived, as we often tell our kids. I think Mark used to tell Bethany that. You'll live, you'll be all right. And they would have been fine, but people who went home dissatisfied, they would have went home unhappy, they would have went home talking about them, just like a lot of you when you go to wedding reception and they do something you don't like, you're like, I don't know why anybody would do that. I would never do that. I'm glad you didn't say amen. When the dog's got you by the leg, it's not a good time to say amen, is it? We leave places and we're all right. Say, well, I'll just get something to eat on the way home because I don't like this food. Right, Haley? I'll just, you know, we get unhappy with when things aren't just the way we want them to be. That's the worst that would have happened is that the reputation of the bride and the bridegroom and their families maybe would have suffered in the community because the Jewish wedding was a, a, a big uh, event and there was a lot to it and so they had a lot of responsibility and now... They had run out of wine. And Jesus didn't see it really at first as that important. His mom comes to him and says, hey, can you do something about this? And he says, this isn't my time yet. This, you know, what, what do I have to do with, with this or with you? And Jesus' mother, like a good mother, uh, ignores him. And she, if you see it in scripture, she doesn't even address what he says. And she looks at the servants and says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And so now, not that wine was important in the sense of this miracle, but because his mother cares, he cares. And because it's important to the bride and the bridegroom, 
and their families and probably their reputation as members of the community who provided a great feast, he cared. The point this morning, and as the song says, if it matters to you, it matters to the master. It matters to Jesus. So why do we worry? Why do we fear when we know that if things are important to us and the things that are important to us are important to him and we have faith that he will take care of us, then why do we allow this, the things of life to burden us and overwhelm us instead of trusting in him day after day, day in and day out? I want to read another scripture to you, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. It says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold, listen, the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. All they do is build nests under our porch. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better then they are, are you hearing this in case you're not a Bible scholar and you don't, you're not familiar with this? God created the birds and he takes care of every need that they have. The birds, they're not planting fields. They're not going to, they have their duties, but they're not doing things to, right? they're just going about their business, doing what God created them to do. And God takes care of them. And then he says, and why ye, why take, or are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought could add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, nor do they, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God clothed the grass of the field, which to, today is, so the grass is there, but tomorrow it's cast into the oven. Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or whether with all shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Now, I want to put this in context of Scripture because people take this, what I'm about to say, they take it out of context. Jesus is saying the most basic things of life, food, clothing, shelter, the things that we need, there's no need to worry about it. He gave us examples through the fowls, through the the lilies that God takes care of them and the grass. All that he does, and he says, God will take care of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Not the newest, most expensive car. Not the biggest, most expensive house. Not the things, all the things that we want, but all of the things that we need If we seek first the kingdom of God, he will supply, add all these things to our lives. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. (coughs) He knows what you need better than you do. You parents know that you know what your kids need better than they do. That's why you don't sit them every day in a high chair and give them popsicles and ice cream sandwiches and Mountain Dew, like my grandma Bill used to do for Noah and Haley too, but especially Noah. I would, we'd pick him up and he'd have ice cream all over his face. And she'd say, he ate so good today. He had three ice cream sandwiches and potato chips and Mountain Lightning. Wasn't that the cheap pop he'd buy? I'm like, Bill! So we don't, I know we got new people, we don't... She's been gone about a year and not quite a year and a half now. She was a Cracker Jack, let me tell you. I'd say that's not eating good. That's eating whatever he wants. But we as parents try to make sure we work in some vegetables and some fruits and some this and some that because we know it's not about what they want, it's what they need. 
what they need to survive, what they need to be healthy. And so we understand that God doesn't always give us what we want, but at times he does. But as much as God knows what we need better than us and he provides for what we need, here's the good part of the message. It's going to get better. Are you ready? He also does, as we see in the scripture, he does care about what is important to us. God is a benevolent God. He's an extra God. That's, that's not a term, it's, you know, I don't know how long it's been around now, but it's a great way to describe some people. Aren't some people extra? Some of you are afraid to look around because you're like, ah, they're right over there. Some people are just extra in everything. Extra in personality, extra in presence, extra in drama, extra in fill in the blank. They're just extra. Well, all in good ways, I serve a God that is extra. God is not just sufficient. He is more and abundantly, he is extra. He is more than I need. He is more than capable. He provides more above and beyond. Amen. Amen. He's extra in a good way. Some of you are extra in a bad way. Anyway, let me move on. <laughs> I love you. But he cares about what's important. And let me describe it like this. There are people in this room that you're like me. If my mower, I just bought a brand new mower last year. I'd had mine for a long time. And finally just, I was like, it's this time for a new one. I'd mowed my yard. I mowed the old church yard. I mowed this yard for two years. I'd mowed mom's. I'd mowed my grandma's a lot. It was just like, it was like about eight or nine years old, but it was actually about 15 years old in, in hours. <clears throat> so, I went and got a new mower beginning of the last summer. If I go to start my mower this week and it doesn't work, I will be in a panic because that's important to me. I like my yard mowed. I like it to look nice. And so, I would be on the phone, can I bring it? Can I, can I get it fixed? Can I get in? How long will it be? I'm going to start making plans. Even if I just mowed, I mean, I'm going to be making plans so it doesn't get overgrown. It's important. It's going to worry me and it's going to bother me. Some of you would be like, thank goodness. The mower won't start. Woo, hallelujah. I can go fishing or I can go do whatever. It Am I right? I mean, some, some people, it's just that they don't care about it. It's important to me. Well, I got news for you. When the fair comes up, if, if we just have, we, we have rain and flooding and tornadoes and the whole fair gets canceled. I don't even know when it is. And it's the same week every year and I still don't know because I don't care. There's nothing wrong with it. Good luck to all of you this year. I hope you win grand champion reserve market Whatever, I don't know any of that stuff. It seems to me like there's 50 winners in every category. I don't understand it. But it's important to the ones that's been getting that hog, that pig out every day and walking it. It's important to the ones that's been getting that lamb or that washing that chicken or whatever it is that they do. They've been spending time because you're, and listen, we think, no, wait, God doesn't care about those things. I beg to differ. Amen. God cares because we care. God cares in a way that we can't even imagine. I'll go back to using the example of a parent. You kids know, you're like, yeah, I know my parents love me. No, you don't understand. They care about every aspect of your life because they have a love for you that you can't quite yet understand. And so there are times where you think, you're thinking, why do my parents even care? Because they love you more than you can imagine. How can God care what color I I drive? Because he loves you. More than you can. It doesn't mean that God says, don't drive a red car, don't drive a blue car. What I'm saying is, there is a benevolence of God and 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 an extra of God that surrounds our lives, and He cares about every aspect of us. That should be a comfort and a shelter to know that we are surrounded and we live under the care of that kind of God. He cares about the things that are important to us. Benevolence means he's well-meaning and kindly. My dad once, um, I, I know it's Haley, I don't remember if it was Abby too, but they had tickets when they were really little. Was it something, Princess? 
Disney on ice. I hope my parents paid for that, or Mark and Debbie, not me. But uh, they were going to take the girls, and it came a bad, a real bad snow. And so my dad drove them all up there and then sat in the car while they went in and watched Disney on ice or whatever. Now, I don't give him too much credit. I'd rather sit in the car too. But the point is, something that was important to those little girls, he said, it's important to me. I look over, I can see, can't you see, I can see Jerry driving away, Columbus sitting in the car while they go watch Disney Princess. Why did he do it? Because it was important to that little girl. God is so much more seeing the aspects of our lives and understanding that it matters. And so quickly, I'm going to look at these things. And if I don't finish, I'll finish next week. I'm not going to rush through this. If it comes to a two-parter, it'll be a two-parter. But number one, I want us to look at the container. The container. Verse 6 and 7, I want to reread it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. We can marvel at the generosity of Jesus' provision. And it's seen in this conversation and this conversion of six full containers that are 20 to 30 gallons each. That's a lot of water. 20 to, gallon, 20 to 30 gallons of these, these stone jars. And he says, go and fill them with water. Why well, do I have time to preach on all this? But listen, that's no easy task. To take those water pots and to fill them or to bring water in and fill them. Because if you fill a, a water pot that holds 20 to 30 gallons of each, do you know how much that's going to weigh? Between 160 to 240 pounds. That's a lot of weight. Water is much heavier than people think that it is. One gallon equals eight pounds. And so, no doubt they probably brought water in to fill them where they were instead of they probably didn't to pick them up, go fill them and bring them back. But they filled them where they were, Probably. But it takes a lot of water and it takes a lot of effort. And I'm not going to have time to preach on all that. But I want you to keep this in mind. That 160 pounds to 240 pounds, that is no mistake. That is the weight of the average man worth of water filled in a container. Now hang on with me. Stay with me. All he needs are the vessels filled with water. Amen. That's all he needs we know that throughout Scripture, the water represents the Holy Spirit. So all God needs to turn the water into wine, all God needs to perform a miracle before our very eyes and in our very lives are vessels that are filled with the Spirit. My friend, if you, as Bethany said, the temple of the Holy Ghost are filled with the Spirit and you are surrendered to Him, God can turn your water into wine. He can turn your problems into answered prayer. He can turn your uh, all the bad things going on in your life into testimonies and miracles of God. But He's got to have vessels that are filled and willing to be converted into whatever God wants. That volume of 120 to 180 gallons of all, that's all the pots, not just one. There were six of them. It is the equivalent to 605 to 908 standard sized bottles of wine today. Now we can get into the difference in the wine and I'm just going to say this. There's enough studies out there. I think it was Perry Stone did one. Very interesting. And he goes into great detail of what their wine was actually like. And that even if we say that it was fermented wine, the 
the, uh, the ratio or the percentage of alcohol in that wine compared to what you go to the liquor store and grab a bottle of wine is two totally different things. So don't take this as some excuse, you know, to say, I'm, I'm just going to go and buy me some Boone's Farm this afternoon and, and get tanked at a wedding. Because that's not what it says. Me, me personally, I got no use for it in my life Amen. or in my home, my family or anywhere. I've never seen anything good come from a drop of alcohol. Amen. Nothing. I'm, I'm, just giving you, I'm just giving you my advice and the saints of God, the ones in my life, I think about my grandparents and my great grandma and those old saints of God. A lot of them wore their, their hair up on their head and, and you know, there wasn't none of them going about back and taking a sip. Now, I'm not here to preach legalism. I'm trying to give you some advice to help you that only bad's going to come. But this wine, he gave 605 to 908 standard sized bottles of wine. It is a perfect picture of the benevolence of God. From what they can understand, it was probably way more than what they actually needed. They probably didn't need all of that. <laughs> I guess I'm like Bethany this morning. Well, I'm just the only one getting blessed out of this. But is there anybody else ever look around your life and say, boy, I got way more than I ever, ever deserved, way more than I ever needed, way more than I've ever earned. I've got more because I serve a God of more and I got a blessing, I got a benevolence, I got a provision. I've got more because I've got a God of more. Hallelujah, hallelujah. When I began to say that, I looked over and I saw Stephen I think of his life before and his life now and he's got more, more than what he ever thought possible. What where God brought you from. You never thought you'd have the family that you have, the wife that you have, the job that you have, the home that you have, but you found a God of more. Woo, hallelujah. He's a God of abundance. My dad... My dad didn't grow up poor, but he didn't grow up with a lot of extra. And there's a lot of kids. And even my grandma would tell the story. When dad played basketball, they lived up around Byington. And my dad would tell this story every other day. After basketball practice, he said, a lot of times I had to walk home all the way from Latham. He said it was cold. By the time I got home, my hair was froze, had ice in it. If I heard that once, I heard it a thousand times. And he said, what I would do, the electric poles, he said, I'd walk one electric pole, then I'd jog one electric pole, and then I'd walk and then I'd jog. And he said, there were times, this was in the early 60s, when he would walk all the way from Latham to Byington. You know how many cars he'd see? None. Can you imagine that? I can't even get my mower turned around on the road. Any time, day, it doesn't matter. Nobody's got any money, but they sure are selling a lot of gas. And my grandma, my dad's mom would tell the story that there was a lot of times she would have to, she would put hide food back for him because he got home after basketball practice or baseball, whatever, after everybody else, she's like, they just eat all the food. And so she just have to put him some back so that he had something to eat when he got home. And so again, I don't want to paint the picture. He never, he weren't poor, but not a lot extra. And so when dad and mom got married and his life went on and they had a, a, a double wide, it's a small double wide, but it was home. Mom sold it last year, moved into my grandma's house. But everything down through life, whether it was cars, vacation, improvements, remodeling, whatever. When mom would come to dad and begin to talk to her, Dennis, what do you think? You want to do this? Now, a lot of you knew my dad. He would say, he'd say, Cheryl, 
Do whatever you want. I've already got more than I've ever had. I've already got more now than I've ever had. What a lesson it's taught me in my life to be content. And I've learned it. I'm tight. I'm tight. I don't like spending money at all. I mean, I hate it. Even when it's for me, I just grip my teeth because I found there's no joy in spending money. There's no joy. There's joy in giving. Amen. There's joy in helping. But there's no, every vehicle, everything, it's just a drain. It's just an expense. I'm going to have to do some accounting lessons here and for some of you to understand what's an asset and what's a liability. But that lesson my dad never forgot is I've already got more now. And he knew that it wasn't just my mom and it wasn't just him. It was God's blessing on his life. I hope you learned this morning that if you are saved right now, then you've already got more than you ever had. The container. Consider this. These were no ordinary water vessels. They were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. This signified the redemptive historical transition from the recurring ceremonial requirements. In other words, they were there for a reason. They would come in and they had had ceremonial washings and cleansing. And so this water would be there. (laughs) You say, what's that matter? Because there would have been some that said, no, 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 not that water. Get him some different water because that's our religious water. That's our ceremonial water. We have to have that for something else, but it is signifying Jesus is saying, there's going to be a time real soon when you're not going to need this for cleansing or washing because I'm going to be enough to cleanse every heart and every soul. And I'm going to change what was religion and I'm going to change what was the status quo and I'm going to change your habits. I'm going to change your rituals and I'm going to give you a true, genuine outpouring of the wine, a Holy Spirit of God. I'm going to give you something better than this cleansing water. It's his way of saying it won't be long and you won't be needing that anymore. For the new wine of the new covenant is here before you. It's about the once for all washing of baptism in the new covenant. And he's saying, I am all the cleansing you will ever need. And also John, he's also going out of his way to tell us that the wine was drawn from stone jars. Stone jars. Normally, when we... And again, I'm not exactly sure. I don't know if, Mark, if you know anything about what would be, but if I'm picturing a stone jar, then I'm not picturing a jar made on a potter's wheel, right? I mean, is it clay? Clay isn't stone. I don't know if these literal pieces of stone that they, I, I don't know. They take stone and somehow mold it together. I, I don't know so much about the material, but here's what I do know. It's a subtle way of showing that Jesus is bringing wine from the rock. He's bringing wine from the rock. And one of the great miracles God did through Moses was to bring water from a rock. The first time, Moses got a little out of control the second time, but the first time God said, strike the rock. He strikes the rock and water flows from the rock and he provides for the children of Israel. But it's a way of Jesus saying there's one better than Moses here. Moses brought water from the rock. (laughs) I bring wine from the rock. You may look at me and you may say, boy, I like his preaching or I like... I like Calvin Evans preaching or there might be one or two people somewhere that like Brian Bear's preaching. Somebody, you may like some of these preachers, but I want you to know, don't you ever put your faith in me because there is one that will never fail you. I might let you down. I might fall short, 
I might do something to disappoint you, but there is one greater than Moses, one greater than a preacher, one greater than a pastor, and he doesn't bring water from the rock. He brings pure wine from the same rock. The water of the law was given through Moses, but the wine of grace came through Jesus Christ. I never do this. Sean, Bethany, I want you to come back. Tim, Dave, if you can come. I want you to sing that song again. We may not sing the whole thing, but at least the verse, the chorus. I only got through one point. I may finish it next week or week after. I think next preaching next week. It's all right. I don't care. That's the fun thing about being a pastor. I got plenty more opportunities. I'll finish it sometime maybe. The God of more, the God of blessing, cares about what you're going through this morning. We've already had some come and pray, and I'm thankful for that. But if you need to pray this morning, if you've got something that you think nobody cares about, that nobody's concerned about, sometimes people are going through things and they're just, they're hoping someone else will notice because they don't want to go and tell them. And sometimes people are like me and sometimes I can be very oblivious to things. Now there are other times where I think the Holy Spirit gives discernment and you begin to realize somebody's going through something. But what I'm trying to tell you, don't wait on somebody else to figure out that you have a need this morning. If you have a need, as soon as she begins to sing, I want you to come. We'll have a time of prayer and we'll go home. But this is a beautiful time for you to come and pray. Would you come?